Hi there, it's the early summer garden tips and tour and I'm going to take you around the garden and show you what works and what doesn't in the hope that that helps you. It's Alexandra here from the Middle Sized Garden YouTube channel and blog and I'll put links to any resources I mention in the description below. If you're new here, the Middle Sized Garden uploads weekly with tips, ideas and inspiration for your garden. So if you'd like to see the videos when you open up YouTube, tap subscribe. The Middle Sized Garden is in South East England in Kent and that roughly equates to a USDA hardiness zone of nine. Because our winters are very mild, it's rare for us to go below minus six Celsius, 21 Fahrenheit. However, our summers are nowhere near as hot and now in early summer, the average temperature is around 16 degrees Celsius. We have until recently had a really prolonged period of dry weather and that's affected the garden, but we just recently had some rain. The first thing I'd like to point out is these climbers on either side of the back door. They're deciduous, so they don't have their leaves in winter and they've just both come into full leaf. This one is a Chinese Virginia creeper and it's called Parthenocissus henriana. And I think a lot of people know that Virginia creeper can be really, really fast growing and can swamp things. But this one is a less fast growing Virginia creeper, although we do have to prune it three times a year. Until recently, there was a belief that having climbers on the sides of your house could damage the brickwork, but recent research has shown that this is much less likely than people think, and also climbers can protect your brickwork. And certainly, they're a great help at keeping heat and cold away from the house. And this is obviously no good in the winter because uh, it doesn't have leaves on it, but in the summer, on really, really hot days, I notice that the room on the other side of it, which is the kitchen, is significantly cooler than other rooms in the house that don't have a climber in front of them. This climber is called a Kebia kinata, and it's the ornamental kiwi, and it is the, probably the easiest plant in the garden. It was here when we moved in, and all we ever do to it is cut off something if it's just a tendril is getting in the way. It doesn't grow very fast and it has these very pretty pink tinged leaves that everyone remarks on when they come into the garden. When you come out the back door there's a terrace and then there are steps up to the parterre. But I'd like to point out an experiment that we're doing on the terrace. One of the most important jobs in early summer is weeding. And I've seen things on the internet that say, get rid of weeds forever, but this is complete rubbish. You will never get rid of weeds forever. You get weeds on artificial turf, you get weeds on concrete, you get weeds everywhere because weed seeds are blown in or they're brought in by birds. And perennial weeds have very, very good roots at sort of winkling under whatever you've got and then popping up through any kind of crack. I've got a no-nonsense guide to weeding video, which I'll put in the description below. But the main thing with weeding is really to try and minimise it. And one of the ways of minimising weeding is to make sure that you've got so many plants that you do want. There's no room for the plants that you don't want to establish. And we're trying an experiment here on the pavers on the terrace because we are allowing the weeds that we like, like the daisies, to grow in the hopes that they will prevent the other weeds from colonising. So far, it's going OK. It's only a few months old. I think it'll probably take a couple of seasons before this establishes and it's looking quite pretty with the daisies but as you can see there are also weeds we don't want in there. You come up the steps from the back door onto what we call the parterre. This is divided into four squares because there are four rooms in the house so the idea is, is that the shape of the garden nearest the back of the house slightly reflects the architecture of the house. The main plants in the parterre are the lavender and they're now 11 years old which is old for lavender and they are beginning to look a little bit gappy. However, we do keep them solid and chunky and coming back by cutting them back really hard in late summer after they've flowered. Just on my right you can see a giant fennel and this was given to me in 2019 by Tom Coward, the head gardener at Gravetie Manor. It's been in the garden for a couple of years, it's only just flowered now. I think the giant fennel is not as invasive as some fennels, although it does self-seed freely. And I think it doesn't always flower, but I do think it's rather magnificent. And speaking of self-seeders, let's look at the herbaceous border, which in early summer is full of self-seeders. The alliums, which self-seed themselves, generally choose where they want to be. The Euphorbia robii, which was creating a lovely citrus green effect in spring, 
and was covering all the ground and making sure there were no bare patches has now gone over and so I will have to pull out at least half of this in order to make space for the plants that I want to plant because now is the time to put out dahlias, chrysanthemums, possibly even gladioli and also to decide where you've got gaps and where you want to put some extra colour. As well as the self-seeders, I've also got some roses in this border which I didn't order. I'm hearing an increasing amount at the moment about people saying that they order something like bare root plants or bulbs and then when they come out they're not what they asked for. And I had ordered a completely different rose and meanwhile this pink one, it's a 1950s rose called Gojard and it is quite pretty but I'm not sure that it's right and I've had it in the garden now for about three years and I've sort of lived with it but I'm really beginning to think that actually I shouldn't have something in the garden unless I love it. So I am thinking of digging it up, although it will take me a while to get around to that because I hate digging up plants that are perfectly happy because I feel I should be grateful that they want to grow in my garden. The other things in the borders include a nine bark, which is producing a lovely dark red leaf, which is a good backdrop for everything else, and that's looking good at the moment. And there's also a rose that I did plant, which is called Souvenir du Dr. Germain. It has a lovely dark red flower, and that's a climber, so I fix it to an obelisk. But the main job now in early summer in your herbaceous border needs to be staking. You can get lots of different kinds of stakes and actually it's a good idea to mix them. I have single pole stakes, one or two of them are ornamental. You could put fence post stakes in. You can use iron hoop stakes which are easy to wedge in where you need them. And you can also build your own natural plant supports from birch twigs, which I'll put a video about that in the description below. The slight problem with that is that if you live in a town, it can be quite difficult to find enough of the sort of birch twigs or other twigs to create the plant supports. But it is a lovely natural way of supporting plants. When you're tying your plants to the stakes, use a soft tie, not something like a wire. And it's also helpful if it's biodegradable. I'll put some recommendations in the description below. So what about the lawn in early summer? We are doing something called no mow May, which means not mowing for the month of May, so that the flowers in the lawn can come up and feed the emerging pollinators. I think the decision on how often and when you mow your lawn is a very personal one and part of developing your own gardening style. There's no doubt that a smart lawn really sets off a herbaceous border beautifully and I always really appreciate it when my lawn is smartly mown. On the other hand, mowing less often saves you time, effort and money. And the emerging flowers that you'll get are helpful to pollinators. The other thing about letting your lawn grow a bit longer is that several head gardeners have told me that it makes it more resistant to drought. So we mow our lawn less if it's very, very dry weather and we tend to only mow every two weeks rather than every week. So we'll have a few days of a smart lawn and then a few days of a shaggier lawn and that seems to be a nice compromise. And another compromise is that you can mow some areas of your lawn smartly and other areas you can leave to grow a little wilder, often at the back of the garden. On the left hand side of the parterre is our north facing wall and obviously as we're in the northern hemisphere that means it's very shady. It's also got quite a few trees on it so it is a really really shady border. Until recently we had a pyracantha hedge running in front of the wall and pyracantha can be a lovely shrub because it has beautiful flowers in the spring and it has berries in the autumn but if it's in a very shady place which this pyracantha was it very rarely flowered and therefore it didn't have many berries. So we took the decision to take it out and we will probably need to add in a little bit more planting and perhaps a few climbers. But at the moment, I'm enjoying the sense of space and being able to see the garden wall. You walk through the parterre and up onto some steps out onto the more open, larger lawn at the back of the garden. And immediately on one side is what I call the difficult shady corner. This corner had a pergola which rotted and collapsed. I did a video on the options for a difficult northeast facing shady corner and what I've decided to do is to make it a little bit of a wildlife haven because Joel Ashton who I interviewed about wildlife gardening a few weeks ago told me that actually bird boxes are very good in shady places because the chicks can get too hot in really hot summer days if you put them on a sunny wall. I bought the bird boxes from the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds because I wanted to make sure that the materials of the boxes and the design meant the birds could actually use it. I think if you buy from a sort of gift shop and you buy pretty gifty bird boxes, I think that what you can find is that the birds never really actually use them. 
There's also two young silver birch trees on either side there. And one of the things to do in early summer, if you have planted trees, is to check that weeds aren't going around the base of the trees. I've let too many weeds grow up to the base of the trees. And this is competition and the trees won't grow so well. And of course, in the dry period that we've had recently, I had to water the trees. It is really important if you've got newly planted trees and shrubs to water them in their first summer. This part of the garden is the least successful part and I quite often don't show it to you. We've got two borders where things don't grow very well and also some raised beds. So I'll deal with the raised beds first. It's incredibly popular at the moment to have raised beds for vegetable gardening. But I was on Instagram the other day and a friend of mine, Jack Wallington, who you can see as Jack Wallington Nature on Instagram, said he's renovating a garden and he's not putting in raised beds because he doesn't think they work for everyone. And I completely agree because my vegetable growing has got so much worse since we had raised beds. The reason seems to be that raised beds drain better than ordinary soil. So if you're in a very dry part of the world, then of course you're going to do much more watering in raised beds. And if you're very busy, and I often forget with watering, then it's so easy for things just not to get enough water. Jack also says that he's noticed that gardens with more slugs and snails tend to have raised beds because they rather like the cracks and crevices that the raised beds create. And speaking of dry, there are two borders here which I have great trouble in getting things going in. One of them is lovely in early summer because there is a plant called Smyrnium perfoliatum or Perfoliate alexanders which is a great self-seeder so you do have to be a little bit cautious about it. But it has a lovely fresh green flower and it just spreads everywhere and it creates a lovely bright green effect in early summer and then it dies down and it disappears. It's a biennial. Without Smyrnium perfoliatum, this border would be in fact very empty. Then there's this other border along the back of the garden, which is a south facing border, but I planted some fruit trees in it, so I've created a lot of shade. And I've also once again created more dryness because of the roots of the trees. And so I've never quite worked out what I want to have under these fruit trees. I've recently decided that actually it's perhaps just a good place to put plants that perhaps have self-seeded elsewhere in the garden and so obviously enjoy living here. And to use it perhaps as a little bit of a dumping ground and an experimental ground. And so we'll see what happens there. At the moment, nothing's out. The main problem I have with these two borders is that when you plant plants, you need to keep them well watered for their first summer. And of course, the hose does not reach these two borders. So what it means is I have to unravel the hose, bring it out into the lawn, fill up watering cans, and then go and water the plants. This doesn't take a huge amount of time. It's maybe five or 10 minutes extra and then you have to wind the hose up again. It's not very long, this amount of time, but it is an extra 10 or 15 minutes on every watering. And of course, if you then get too busy and you miss it out, the plants don't do well. So the advice I'd have with this one is that if you are doing plumbing in your house or if you are doing landscaping in your garden, try and make sure there are taps within easy reach of all your borders. Because once the garden is done, it's too much of a big job to dig up the borders and then to lay hose piping. We did think about it, but we're not going to do it. I'm just going to carry on unrolling the hose and of course, choosing plants that once they're established are perfectly happy in fairly dry climates. As you can see, this hedge is getting quite overgrown and early summer is a very good time to clip your hedges. However, it's also the time when there are nesting birds in those hedges. And in the UK, it's illegal to disturb or destroy nests by clipping hedges. It's not illegal to clip hedges just to destroy the nests. So we do need to clip these hedges, but we need to listen quite carefully to see if there are any nesting birds in them. It's a slight complication with this cypress hedge because if it grows too long and gets too woody, then we can't cut it back too much because cypress doesn't regrow from the wood. So it's a bit of a balance there between the birds nesting and clipping the hedge. The privet hedge grows very fast and you can clip it back as much as you want. So that's less of a problem. You can see here that the foxgloves I mentioned on the late spring garden tips and tour have now flowered and I am very glad I left them there. But if you saw that, you'll realise that they've self-seeded far too close to a hydrangea and the hydrangea is not very happy. So the minute that flower is over, I will have to pull it out. I've got a playlist with the other garden tips and tours at the end of this video and do let me know what your early summer tips are. And thank you for watching. Goodbye.